Okay, so we're going to continue Acts chapter 20. This is Paul's challenge to t for us to take heed. And we said last week how this is such a unique passage in Scripture because in Acts we see Paul ministering the gospel to, to Jewish people who were unsaved, bringing the gospel to them, how he brought the gospel to unsaved pagans in, in, in Athens in Acts 17, and how later he'll be giving the gospel to politicians like Agrippa and Festus and sharing his testimony. So it's very interesting to see how Paul, according to his audience, tailors his message, but always the gospel, but different aspects of it. Sometimes his testimony, sometimes not, and just very different. But here, this is a very unique passage because Paul is bringing the gospel to church leaders at Ephesus. So it's the only passage in the book of the Acts where we see Paul preaching or teaching to a group of church leaders. And so it is a premier ministry passage in the book of Acts dealing with ministry. So let's read from verse 25 and we'll go down to the end. And we're going to drill down in the word tonight. Okay, so if you hear that drill over there, just think to yourself, we're drilling down in the word. We're going to drill for those springs of living water in the word of God. That's what they're doing out there. We're, we're drilling. Okay, here we go. And now behold, I know ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to over all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, Ye, yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. This is a very amazing and unique statement in all of the New Testament. Because it's the only word that Jesus gave during his earthly ministry that is quoted somewhere else other than in the Gospels, except in, during his earthly ministry, he was in Acts 1 before he ascended. But this is, this is a brand new statement that we read nowhere else in the Gospels, but he said it during his, earth, his earthly ministry. Isn't that interesting? So what did he say? What did Jesus say? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Red letters in my Bible. There it is. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him into the ship. So let's pray. So now, Lord, use this word and time together in your word to, for us to take this challenge, as Paul says, to take heed to ourselves and to all the flock, and that we need to take heed to a number of things, Lord, here. So help us to take Paul's challenge as your servants in this generation upon which we live. Thank you for the timelessness of the Bible, that Paul could give this message in Ephesus to gospel leaders there 2,000 years ago. And this same message is applicable to us in our modern city of New York now. So thank you for the timeless, inspired Word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what a challenge. So, Paul here says in this passage that he had preached the kingdom of God in verse number 25. He says, I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. 
And he said that he had been doing it with them. If you go back to chapter 19 and verse 8, it says there that he was disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And when you begin to read the book of Acts, in the very first few verses of the book of Acts, it's speaking of Jesus Christ in his ministry when he rose again from the dead in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that he showed himself alive with infallible proofs, and, he, and Jesus himself spoke of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus in his earthly ministry preached the kingdom of God. His resurrection ministry, he preached the kingdom of God. The very last verse of the book of Acts. Guess what Paul was doing? Go to the very last verse of the book of Acts. And it says, preaching what? What was he preaching? The kingdom of God. And teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And the book of Acts just ends as if it's not over. He's going to keep on preaching. And Paul's life does go beyond that last verse of the book of Acts, preaching. So the kingdom of God is in the beginning of Acts. It's at the end of Acts. Here we are in the middle of Acts. He's preaching the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God? That the kingdom of God ultimately speaks of the sphere of God's rule. The kingdom of God is not just the millennium. Aren't we looking forward to when Jesus establishes his earthly kingdom on earth? And we do pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I believe that's a prayer for Jesus to come back, establish his kingdom on earth. But there is a sense where the kingdom of God is now, because who's king over all the earth? Who's always king over all the earth? God. God is king over all the earth. So we could say his kingdom is now because he's the king. But yet we can also say his kingdom is coming soon because Jesus is is not seated in Jerusalem right now as the king sitting on the throne of David. And we believe that he will. So his kingdom is coming soon and his earthly kingdom is not yet. But he was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. I've gone preaching. That's very interesting. Announcing the coming of Christ, but the rule of Christ. So Alva McLean has kind of written a landmark book called The Greatness of the Kingdom that dispensationalists pretty much have gravitated to. And he says there can be no kingdom in the total sense without the ruler, the realm, and the reigning function. So for there to be a kingdom, there has to be a ruler. There have to be subjects of that rule. And there has to be a realm of that rule and a function for the, rule, for the ruler to, to carry out. So the kingdom of God is now, for God is the king over all. But as I said just now, it's not yet. The kingdom is coming soon. But Paul, in preaching the kingdom, what does that mean? That he was preaching the gospel. So if he was preaching the things concerning and gone preaching the kingdom of God, and he was disputing the things concerning the kingdom of God, what was he preaching? The gospel. <laughs> Now go to Colossians 1.13. I'll just wrap this little introduction up. But it's important for us to understand the kingdom of God. Because there's a lot of false ideas of it. Some people don't believe in an earthly literal kingdom of Jesus Christ coming. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. But in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, can you get there? And we could all uh, read that together. And this is really the preaching of the kingdom of God. And it's a deliverance. The preaching of the kingdom of God is the preaching of the gospel so that those who are under the rule of Satan would be delivered from the rule of Satan and his darkness that, that results in death. They would be delivered from that and they would enter into the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. So that Jesus Christ will be their Savior and their Lord. When you're saved, you enter a new what? You enter a new kingdom. You leave a kingdom. The kingdom of darkness. You enter a new kingdom. The kingdom of light. You, you leave an old king who was Satan. And you have a new king. His name is 
Jesus. That's the kingdom of God, preaching the gospel of deliverance from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. Colossians 1, 13 says, if we could read that verse together, it says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So it's through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through the power of his gospel that we're delivered from the kingdom of Satan and brought into the, the kingdom of God. So Paul says, this is what I preached among you for these three years. And now he's meeting for them, with them for the last time. And last week we spoke about his consistency in ministry, how he ministered with humility and tenderness and patience. We spoke about his courage in ministry. I love that verse, Acts 20, verse 24, where he says, none of these things move me. That's a great memory verse, by the way. Neither count on my life as dear unto myself, nor that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And so his posture was always to move forward. His passion was to focus, to focus on Christ, his priority to finish. Move forward, focus, and finish. So then we want to go to take heed. Paul says, I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. That's the purposes of God found in Jesus Christ. And then verse 28, take heed, therefore. The first thing we must take heed to is who? To yourself. <laughs> because when you wake up in the morning, you're standing in front of your biggest enemy, <laughs> your own flesh. It's easy for us to see how other people make life hard, but we have to look at ourselves and face ourselves and take heed to yourself, he said. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to your carelessness. Take heed to your shallowness. Take heed to your covetousness. Take heed to your laziness. Take heed to your selfishness. Take heed. The first and most important thing to take heed is, is to yourself, not to see the little peas in other people's eyes and not see the big logs in our own eyes. Take heed to yourselves. I've asked a few people to read verses. Jackie is first. Jackie, could you read Luke chapter 21? Because Jesus taught us in this verse to take heed to ourselves. Jesus said, take heed to yourself. Jackie chapter, Luke chapter 21 and verse 34, if you're following along, Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Okay, so Jesus said, take heed of yourself, because if you don't, you're going to end up in Hawaii surfing, and you've got to be taking heed not to go off surfing. Isn't that what it, wait, 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 we got to interpret the Bible right. Okay, he didn't say we can't surf. He said surfeiting. What in the world is, you know what surfeiting is? It means being hungover. Literally, it means having headaches after a drinking binge. And so he says, surfeiting and drunkenness. And he says, do not let your hearts be overcharged. Have you ever been overcharged for something? Like you pay too much for something? <laughs> That's the idea there. In other words, when you, if you ever got ripped off, you, you like bought something and you said, why did I buy that? I didn't have to spend all that money on that. Has that ever happened to you? first car we bought right we, we wondered if we got ripped off by the used car salesman but I think we did all right actually we just weren't, weren't sure if we got overcharged but when you get overcharged for something you're overly burdened about it is the idea so Jesus is saying beware lest your hearts be overburdened with being hung over from drinking because if you drink and get drunk and then you are hung over, you're gonna be over, you're overcharging yourself. You're burdening, you're putting cares and burdens upon yourself. Jesus said, take heed to yourself. Paul said, take heed to yourself. I've asked Jeannie to read 1 Timothy chapter four, verse 16 in her favorite Bible, okay, <laughs> which you need 
You need a magnifying glass to read those words. What Jeannie's going to do, 1 Timothy, Paul says take heed in, in to Timothy, who was a pastor in Ephesus, okay? So he says, take heed to yourself. And he says to the doctrine, be more of your, be more afraid of yourself than the world system. He, Paul doesn't tell Timothy, take heed to the devil, although the devil is a roaring lion. And we need to take heed to the devil. But he says, take heed to yourself. Take heed, take heed to the world system. That is full of lust and pride. Yes, take heed to that. But take heed to yourself. Because we're, we're easily deceived by this world system. We're easily deceived by the devil. Take heed to yourself. The second thing is, he says, not only to yourselves and to all the flock. Now, the word flock, if you look at that Greek word, it's literally part, it's it's a, the, the same root word that we use our word, that we get our word pastor from. Pastor is, means a shepherd, a poiman. And, it, and that's, it's a similar word, but it's a noun there. Or a, a, it's another noun, but it's similar. Flock. A flock is the sheep that the pastor cares for. And I was, th I was thinking about this. Like, why do we use the word pastor? Why don't we use the word bishop or elder, as we said last week? And, and I think I even have a slide here. These three terms are synonymous, referring all to the same office, but different aspects of one office. Elder, speaking of the dignity of the office, overseer of the duty, the pastor to the devotion. Why, why is it that we kind of most affectionately use the word pastor to, to speak of our, of our church leaders? You know why, I think? Maybe it's because Jesus was the good shepherd. And he... Uh, revealed himself as the good shepherd and he's the great shepherd and and there's the emphasis of jesus he is the the bishop of our soul he is he is the elder of our life in that same sense but he's a shepherd and a good shepherd and shepherds were actually looked down on in the world so in a way that we take we just kind of i think we gravitate to that term and and even in this verse paul is telling these elders to take heed to the flock because you're like shepherds and here is where he uses these two other words which god has made you an overseer that's a same word as a bishop one who looks over the flock and to feed the flock that's that word to shepherd or to pastor to feed is literally to pastor to lead and feed and he says, the church of God. Now, remember when we were studying in Acts and that big mob that was leading a riot in Ephesus? Remember that? Remember what it was called? Remember what they called that big mob in Ephesus? Charlie knows what they called it. They called it an ecclesia. That was an ecclesia of men, an ecclesia of riot. But here he says, the church, the ecclesia of God. That's who we are, the church of God. Take heed, he says, and he says, feed. We have the best food in town, the word of God. And we're a hungry people. We need to feed and be led into the word of God. Now, this is a powerful passage. He tells us to feed the church. Whose church is it? Is it my church? Whose church is it first? Who's the owner of the church? God is. It's his church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's ultimately God's church. It's the church of God. Now, why is it his? What does it say there? What did he do? He purchased. He bought it. He bought the church. <laughs> he paid for the church. So he owns it. When you pay for something, you own it. He paid for the church. To, he bought the church. The members of the church. What did he buy the members of the church with? His own blood. And whose blood is that? Whose blood? Jesus' blood. And in that verse, what name is used for the one who shed his blood? 
I'm sorry? God. God. It's the blood of God, Paul is saying here. Did you see that? He says, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his. His goes back, is, a, is that an antecedent? Is that the right word? To the name of God. Isn't that something? That the blood of Jesus, that, that's a powerful verse for the deity of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, shed his blood to purchase us out of the kingdom of darkness and the devil to be our king and our Lord and our savior. We are bought. We're his. We're his. Don't ever think if you, if you believe in Jesus, you're not the devil's anymore. You're Jesus's. He owned you. And he owns the church. And we have to remember that the church is his. We are stewards of the church. And, you know, hey, when we're saved, where are we? Where are we positionally put? Into Jesus Christ. So the church is his. But if you are his, the church is yours the church is no more yours than another member of the church the church is we could say yes the church is his and he is head he is lord he is king of the church he purchased the church and it is his to rule but since i am his the church is mine and the church is ours amen the church is ours we're in his body we've been purchased by his blood so we need, to, we need to take heed to the church. And that's why we're here as well, to pray for the needs in the church. You know, one of our members, Jeff Lee, his father was assaulted um, earlier this week, I think. Uh, was it yesterday or Monday? It was yesterday. And, I mean, he sent a picture, just his father's face was bloodied. He's got whiplash. He's not able to close his left hand, I think. And in the hospital so what we need to pray you know for Jeff's dad his name is Lloyd and bear that burden you know and someone else in our church she I don't know if I should say this but I think it's okay she got kicked by an autistic student she's a, a teacher of autistic children and she was kicked in her stomach and they were at the doctor today actually Sister Megan, Jeff's wife, you know, so we need to pray for her that the Lord would strengthen and we need to take heed to one another and love one another. So I've asked um, Brother Tim to read some verses. Go to Ezekiel chapter 34. And this is a whole chapter about the, 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 the evil, selfish shepherds in the days of Israel the leaders who took advantage of the flock and did not care for the flock, did not love the flock. They did not take heed to their flock as we are commissioned. And I, I put just a, a couple of bullet points here. We're going to read in a moment. The disease, they did not strengthen. The sick, they did not heal. The, the broken, they did not bind up. The driven away, they did not bring back again. The lost, they have not sought. So we need to take heed. So if we're going to read Ezekiel chapter 34. I've asked Brother Tim to read verses 2 through 4, please. Scriptures say, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? He eat the fat, and he clothe you with the wool. He kill them that are fed. But ye feed not the flock. The disease have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. Amen. Yeah, thank you for reading that. And it's it speaks for itself. We need to take heed to the flock, and we need to seek the lost, and we need to seek those who are broken to bind them up and 
there's a lot of hurting people right in our own congregation and in our city as well. So the next thing he says, if you go back to our passage, is we need to take heed to false teachers. Take heed to false teachers. And then Paul says some very... He, oh, he actually prophesies some very specific things about the, the, the ministry in Ephesus. And when we, you read First and Second Timothy, they happen. So look what he says here. He says, For this I know, verse 29, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul has warned them and he has challenged them to take heed to false teachers. And the, the thing that we need to keep in mind is this. The greatest threat to the local church is not necessarily the world out there and everything they're doing. It's ultimately going to happen from within the church if we're not careful. Now, I don't say that we should be paranoid about one another. Like, oh, are you the one that Paul was talking about? Yeah. But he says literally that there would come of your own selves, think of that, that would speak perverse things, which means to distort and twist. And then they would turn away. He says they would turn away. They would draw away disciples after them and drag them away from the flock. And literally the idea of draw away is they will split disciples from the church. Have you ever heard of a church split? That's what he's saying. It's going to happen in Ephesus. There's going to be a ch big church split. And it's going to happen because there will be teachers who will come into the congregation and start teaching their false doctrines. And you must know the truth. You've got to know the truth to, to keep the church doctrinally sound and pure. Take heed to false teachers. Now, there's whole... There's like whole books in the New Testament about false teaching. It's not necessarily a popular subject, but read the book of Jude. Read the book of 2 Peter. They're predominantly about false teachings that will come. 1 John, it's really a lot about false teaching. He says that there will many be many false prophets, antichrists. And then 3 John talks about the false teachings of preaching false preaching, uh, false Christs. We have to beware. Jesus said, take heed. He used the word beware, which is the same word of take heed. Beware of the leaven, the doctrine of the Pharisees. Beware of the false prophets, Jesus said, which come to you in sheep's clothing. Jesus said, beware, take heed to false prophets. He said, beware, take heed to the scribes. Beware, take heed to the, the, the Pharisees. Beware, take heed. He says, among your own selves, people will speak perverse things. Split the church. Now, of course, later on, and outside, after the book of Acts, Paul writes First and Second Timothy. He writes uh, later after his, because when the book of Acts ends, he's in his Roman imprisonment. And what many people believe that's when he wrote, like, his prison epistles, Philippians and Ephesians, but then later on he wrote 1 Timothy, and then his last epistle was 2 Timothy. And where was Timothy a pastor? In Ephesus. And if you go through this, and we won't go through everything, but I do want to look at a couple things in 2 Timothy. Paul begins 1 Timothy saying that there was these strange doctrines coming into the church. And then in 1 Timothy 4, he says that there were seducing spirits. And remember, doctrines of demons? Remember, 1 Timothy 4, doctrines of demons, seducing spirits. In chapter 5, he talks about widows who were even going from house to house and teaching things that they should not be teaching. 
And it's interesting, these widows went from house to house. Paul went from house to house, teaching the truth, teaching the gospel. And then in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, Timothy he says that there were those who would deny the true doctrine of Christ. And they, would be, they were preaching some kind of a prosperity gospel. They were saying that gain is godliness. If Jesus is your Savior, you'll, you'll, you'll get material gain in life. You know, they were preaching like a prosperity gospel. And then in 2 Timothy, so I do want to go to this because he's saying take heed. And this here's the prophecy fulfilled. Go to 2 Timothy. And... Paul does something that doesn't probably please. Paul is not a people pleaser. You know what he does in 2 Timothy? Is he actually names names of the false teachers. So that the people would know, like, he, he didn't just talk about, like, what they were, like, who is he talking about? Oh, who, 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 who is that? Do you know who Paul is talking about? He didn't even leave it up to question. He named their name. He said, watch out for that guy. <laughs> okay. So look in 2 Timothy. Each chapter, he names two names. Look at chapter 1, verse 15. He says, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. And as I read this, I always wonder, were these guys, I believe that they were there in Acts 20. Because he says, there will become among your own selves. And he says here that Phygelus and Hermogenes have turned away, and he says even all Asia, all these guys that he's talking to in Acts 20, they didn't stick. A lot of them turned away. So there's Phygelus and Hermogenes. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. It tells the actual false doctrine. I won't try to explain it, but in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16, he talks about shunning profane and vain babblings. In verse 17, he says, Their word will eat as doth a canker, like a, a cancer. It will spread. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus? And he may have mentioned the same Hymenaeus in, chap in 1 Timothy, but here he mentions him again. And he says, and he says Concerning the truth, they have erred. And so he names their name, and he, he, he points out their false doctrine. And then in chapter 3... In verse 8, he mentions two names, but look at these guys. Who are these two? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood who? Moses. Who were they withstanding Moses? Where were they? What were they? They were one of the magicians in Pharaoh's court. Remember when Moses was doing those signs? And that sometimes the... Magicians of Pharaoh could do the same thing. Janus and Jambres, many people believe, were some of those magicians in Pharaoh's court. And what's amazing here is you don't read about Janus and Jambres in the Old Testament. You have to read the New Testament to find out about them. That's why you read the whole Bible. But it, it, the point is, is that Janus and Jambres were somehow related to, to the world's magic and to pagan type of, of religion or faith. And now think of the temple in Ephesus. The temple was to who? Diana, Artemis. And remember when the Christians were saved? They did that big book burning of, and I believe those books related to some of the practices and witchcraft related to that temple, Diana. It shows they were breaking with it. But I, I believe that based on what these widows were doing and teaching from house to house, as well as others, that they were trying to bring the pagan worship of Diana into the church and mix the truth with the error. And that's, that's always the devil's lie, to, to mix error with truth and kind of put it together. That's basically American Christianity. It's kind of like Baal worship. <laughs> like Old Testament Baal worship with Jesus on the, on the surface. We have to be careful that we have a pure faith. Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, and there were people like that with corrupt minds who were reprobate in the faith, who were in the church. And the last two names he mentioned, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10 and 14, he mentions, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and then he mentions in verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith, 
did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. So, you know, I, I thought of this, and I thought, what are false teachings that are going to try to come into our church and confuse us and separate us? What are false teachings even in our culture? And there's quite a few. But I thought the first, you know what the first one I thought of? I thought of ecumenical evangelism. Now that kind of comes from the left. Ecumenical evangelism is, it's, it kind of goes to what is dear to our heart, which is to what? See soul saved and evangelize. But ecumenical evangelism is let's get together with those who deny Jesus Christ outright. I mean, deny his virgin birth, deny his bodily resurrection. Or with Rome, let's get together with Roman Catholics in order to evangelize the lost. And let's all work together. And it's called ecumenical evangelism. And you know who popularized that? Billy Graham, who is pretty much considered like so beloved in evangelicalism, but he he brought this very dangerous trend. And it's it split churches. It split, it split churches while not saying that it didn't do some good, not saying that people weren't saved. God knows the hearts. There's another one. This will really get people upset. And it, it doesn't come from the left. It comes more from the right, if you will, the more like very hyper-conservative. But it's King James only. And... And I have to be very careful here. I know there's different streams of King James Onlyism. You know, we actually changed our Constitution to say we use the King James Bible. We, I love the King James Bible. I think it's a marvelous, wonderful translation of God's Word based on the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, and the Greek text of Textus Receptus. But a man named Peter Ruckman came along and said that the King James translators improved the translation of the, that the King James is like an improved translation of the original words that were breathed out by God. So here's what we have to know, the, the, here's what the Bible teaches. God breathed out his word, right? When God breathed out to holy men of God, the Holy Spirit moved them, and what did they do? They wrote. Word for word, the very word of God. So when Matthew wrote his, his gospel, every word Matthew wrote, as God breathed out, was the very word of God, that Greek word. That Greek word was the inspired word. And we believe God is going to preserve his word. He's going to preserve what he breathed out. That means he's going to preserve what? The original language Greek word or the original language Hebrew words. He's going to preserve those words. If I come along, though, and say that any translation... Now, here's the thing. No translator is inspired. Right? Do we understand that? Whether they translate the Hebrew and Greek words into French, the translator's not inspired. What is he trying to do? He's trying to find the best French word that, relate, that, that, in, that translates the Hebrew or Greek word, Right? No English translator is inspired. No translator is inspired. Who is inspired? The original language writers. Paul, Peter, when they wrote. They were the inspired. And as we have a translation that is, that is faithful and accurate to what they wrote when God breathed out, we have the word of God. We have the word of God in our, in our language. But the, but the King James onlyism says that if you change one word of the King James Bible, you're changing the word of God. Like, there might be another way to translate that word now. Sometimes word change meanings. You know, so, sometimes there's another word that, that you could use to translate. Actually, the King James translators knew there were different words they could have used. They sometimes put them in the margins. The King James translators never believed that they were, their words that were inspired like the words of Peter or Paul were inspired. So what I'm saying is this, King James onlyism, when it's saying that the translation 
is equal to the original manuscript, that's dangerous. And it's, it has split churches. We've had people leave our church over this issue. So we need to be careful. And I, I, there, there's another thing, a lot of things, but I, I don't, but I could say the charismatic movement, you know, come to our institute, you'll learn more about that. We're going to talk about ecumenical evangelism and the neo-evangelical movement that really kind of was named in the 1940s. We'll be talking about that in our institute. I was talking to Micah earlier, and, he, and I asked him this question, you know, what are, what are teachings that arise within the church that have done untold damage to the church? And he, he brought out a very good, a good one, and, and that's evolution. And a view of Genesis 1 through 11 that's not based on a literal historical, grammatical truth. Because if you get Genesis 1 through 11 messed up, you get creation wrong, you get gender wrong, you get sin wrong, you know, you get the flood wrong. I mean, and if, if you don't take those things literally, then you have a very wrong view of the Word of God. And these things have, you know what, these things came, like when you think about evolution, basically what happened is Darwin wrote his 1859 on the origin of species and then and then people said oh this is science you know this is good science and then young men went to seminary and they started teaching this to young men in seminaries and those young men left seminaries and what did they do they stood in pulpits and started to preach on evolution in their churches and so it came from it came into the church so this is where we all have to take heed to the church okay take heed to god's word i'll be done I won't say much, but verse 32, I'll just have, I, I did ask um, Angelica to read. I'm just going to have you read the verses. I won't make any comments. I'll try not to make any comments, I should say. Angelica, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter tells us to take heed to the word of God. Amen. We have a more sure word of prophecy than any experience we can ever have in this life. And I've asked Ellie to read 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Sister Ellie, if you could please read that. Oh, that's okay. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 16, please. So I, I just wanted to read that twice because he said, take heed to yourself. That was one thing, but then to the doctrine, to the word of God. So we need to take heed to God's word. And so go back to Acts 20 and just look at that verse 32, what Paul says about God's word. It's very beautiful. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. He says, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. What, what is God's word able to do? What does it say? It's able to what? Build you up. Build you up. We want to be built up. And then what else does God's word give us? It says, give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified, set apart. So take heed to God's word. And the last thing he says is take heed to covetousness. Paul says, I have coveted no man's silver, gold, or apparel. And then that's where he quotes the words of Christ. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And isn't it amazing? that false teachers then and false teachers now are what they're covetous money hungry they're money hungry you can often spot a false prophet by the car they drive no i'm just kidding <laughs> by the yachts they own by the houses multiple houses and mansions they build for themselves so just be careful and take heed take heed to yourself take heed to the church take heed to false teachers to god's word take heed to covetousness let's pray